demonstrate some of the ways you can use these types of inverse calibrations. Um, so I'm going to get started pretty quickly here because we do have just a brief amount of time today. So I'll give a quick introduction to me uh, and a little bit about Veris Engineering in case you're not familiar. And then after that, I'll go straight into a live M calibration demonstration. And that demonstration, I'm going to show three different uh, load cases. Uh, I'm going to talk about an abacus load case uh, where we're doing a tension dog bone. I will show you a ANSYS load case where we're doing compression. And this one is if you want to take into account uh, the, the effects of friction on your data. So we're going to do a compression load case. Uh, and then the last one will be an LS Dyna. This is going to be an explicit simulation. It's going to be in a ball impact uh, test. And I'll show you all the files and talk about how we set it up both in the finite element program and the um, and in M calibration. So briefly, a little bit about me. Uh, I have my PhD from Brown University in solid mechanics. While I was there, I worked on high frequency viscoelasticity of uh, tissue engineered materials. Uh, so I did a lot of work on going to high frequency and high strain of those materials. Uh, it, was, it was an interesting problem because they're very soft. They have a modulus of uh, about a thousand pascals. Um, so this is, you know, one times 10 to the six softer than plastic materials uh, and a couple orders of magnitude softer than a lot of rubbers. Uh, currently, I'm a senior engineer at Verist Engineering. And while I'm here, I focus on a few different aspects. I help run our test lab here. I run some of the tests. Uh, uh, and I expand our test capabilities, focusing on high rate and impact testing to capture the high strain rate response of polymer materials. I also do material modeling, so I will select and calibrate material models for uh, internal projects as well as our clients uh, for many of the finite element programs that we work with. And I also do some finite element analysis in LS Dyna, Abacus, and ANSYS. Briefly, just a bit about Verist Engineering. We focus on a few different areas here, but a, a lot of what we do is on this slide here. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, we do a lot of mechanical testing and characterization of polymer materials. That's thermosets, thermoplastics, rubbers, biomaterials, uh, elastomers, and composites. Um, after we do that, we take the test data and then we'll, we'll, we'll calibrate a material model to the test data. Uh, and we, we really shine here, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about M calibration and how we can use that with external finite element codes. But of course, we also sell our own library of material models uh, uh, called PolyUMOD. Uh, and then from there, for many clients, we take the material models that we've calibrated, and then we run a finite element analysis. We use most of the uh, major finite element packages, and we have a lot of experience uh, with advanced finite element analysis, including you know nonlinearities in material or geometry, uh, contact, explicit and implicit simulations. Uh, we also uh, do a lot of work with console and do multi-physics simulations. Uh, uh, and we have a few experts here uh, on computational fluid dynamics uh, as well. So we'll use either console for that or for we also have star CCM. We are uh, not shown here, but we do a lot of failure analysis. We do that both for polymer materials, uh, typical or not, sorry, not typical, uh, metals, different processes. We also have an expert on reliability here who does MEMS and sensors um, and, and can help you out in all sorts of ways from choosing sensors to troubleshooting a MEMS processing application uh, to reliability of parts uh, other than MEMS as well. So I want to talk a little bit about our experimental capabilities because it'll come up in a little bit. So we have here some images showing what we do, but we tend to do advanced experimentation. So a lot of what we do, we use digital image correlation uh, or DIC to do our strain and displacement measurements. This is a great full field non-contact method to measure either strains or displacements. Um, uh, and that, that is why we use it. And then the lower right there, you can see uh, the, the, the strain field from a, a dog bone test on uh, um, that looks to be an HDPE to me, although it could be some other type of material. Uh, so we have a lot of different capabilities, some of which are listed here. Uh, so if you have any questions about either our test capabilities or what tests might be best 
for your problem uh, or your uh, your material, please let me know. And we can talk either, uh, we can talk afterwards about how, how you could do that testing. So now on to uh, the demonstration. So bear with me for a minute as I, um, as I bring up a new um, new screen. So you should be able to see um, an M calibration screen here. Uh, so what you what, what you'll see is uh, I've got two load cases. We're going to focus on the first one. Uh, this is an ASTM ASTM D638 Type 4 dog bone that we did a tension test on. This is a nylon material. Um, so that, that's, that's the data there. And over here on the right, you can see the force versus displacement curve for that test. So this is just the raw output from the machine that we used to test it. So force in Newtons, displacement in millimeters. I'm gonna open up the load case here to show you what we're working with. So in the load case here for load case type, um, you can see I've selected Abacus external solver. So we have multiple ways we can use an external finite element program to, to do these inverse calibrations for us. This first one I'm gonna show you is the Abacus external solver. And then after that, I'll show you our general external solver. If you're using Abacus, the Abacus external solver is a little bit easier for you to use. It requires less upfront work. So we recommend it if you can use it to fit into your application. So now if I was creating this from scratch, I would go in here and hit load experimental file, and I choose that file that has time, force, and displacement in there. After that, I would hit this button that says select abacus input file. So now I'm gonna show you the input file that I used. Um, so that's shown here. This is just a normal abacus input file. You can see all the node definitions there, um, and you can see uh, the, this is a loading definition. But what I really wanted to point out is right now in this file, um, I have a material defined that I've called MCAL material. And I've just defined it as an elastic material with the Young's modulus of 900 uh, and uh, MPA and a Poisson's ratio of 0 0.4. Uh, that'll, that'll be important in a second, but that is not the material that I actually care about, material model that I actually care about. This is just a placeholder I put in. So I've shown you the input file and something and, and what we need there. Uh, next, I'm just gonna show you what the model itself looks at like uh, in, M, in uh, Abacus. So you can see here, I've got an Abacus model. This is the dog bone. Um, I've used one eighth symmetry. So I've, I've done a symmetry plane in the, uh, in the, the Y plane, the Z plane and the X plane. So this is one eighth of the sample. So for boundary conditions, I've used all those symmetry. So this here is held fixed. And then I've connected all these top elements here to a, a, a reference point. Uh, and I pull up on that reference point to, uh, to uh, put the displacement on. And that's also where I calculate the force. This abacus external, um, this abacus external load case requires you uh, to have one history output. So I have a history output here that I've cleverly named H output one, thanks to Abacus. Uh, and if I go in there and edit it, you see that I'm using only the re uh, reference point set. And in there, I'm only asking for the translate, the translation in the Y direction, U2, and the force in the Y direction, RF2, to be output. So those are the only outputs there. So what this model is going to do, it, it, I've set it up with the displacement from this experiment here. Uh, and from that force, uh, at that, that displacement is applied at that remote point, which is connected to everything there. Uh, and then it outputs the force and the displacement of that point. Earlier I said, we didn't care about the material we have in there. After I selected the input file, it asked me the name of the material that I wanna replace. In this case, I only have one material in this uh, input file and it's MCAL material. So I selected that. And then the next thing you need to select is the direction of the applied force. And this is in the two direction. Uh, and th that was set up from the beginning. So I'm gonna hit save. And right now we're just gonna hit run once. I'm gonna let M calibration run in the background. And Abacus, uh, M -cal have M calibration call Abacus in the background. Abacus has started to run. 
Uh, it's going through the iterations there. Uh, while that runs, I'm going to show you the results from something I ran beforehand. I'm just going to open the files. This is the file I set up beforehand. Uh, I'll look at, so this is the, the Mises stress in the sample. And if I come over here and animate it, it's probably going to go extremely fast. Let me slow that down. So as, in, as you can see, we take the sample, we pull up, and then we're just showing the Mises stress contours here. So again, this is a, 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 a fairly simple um, simulation, but you might want to use this if uh, you're concerned with necking in your material. Uh, you know, so a lot of thermoplastics, when they get to large uh, strains, they start to get a strain localization in the material next. If you're doing a single element, finite element calibration, you can't really capture that, uh, that necking that you would, that you would see in, in real life. So the way you can overcome that is if you do these inverse calibrations. The inverse calibration, uh, if you set up your material model correctly, will hopefully show that localized necking uh, and then show it propagating along the gauge section. This one here doesn't particularly show it, but um, that's, uh, that's okay. So I believe MCAL is done running. There you go. Uh, so you see here the red is the raw data straight from the, the load machine. Uh, the blue is the simulation from uh, Abacus. So you can see we've got a pretty large amount of error here. It's about 30%, 29% error, which you can see down here in the lower right. Um, so this material model might not be a very good uh, guess. There are a lot of issues. It's initially too soft. It misses the yield a little bit. Uh, so, so there could be issues with this model. But one thing I'd like to point out that you need to keep in mind when you, when you do these types of inverse calibrations is that this red line was the raw force displacement from our universal test frame. That will include all the compliance that is associated uh, with uh, the machine and the fixturing. And that could be why we're seeing a difference here. So I have another load case here. We're not gonna run it. I'm just gonna show you this. This is um, the, this green line here uh, is the results from, uh, uh, is, is the data where I've taken the crosshead compliance and the machine compliance out of the displacement data. So we get a better, better representation uh, of the actual force versus displacement that is going into um, that is going into the sample. So you can see there that really uh, uh, fixed the the issue here. We're matching the initial strain uh, or displacement here up until maybe three quarters or half of a millimeter, but we're still having issues here. So that would be something we'd want to look into. If we wanted to, we could turn this off and we could hit run calibration. Uh, and then MCAL would go through and change the material parameters for the model we have down here. Uh, and then with that, it would try to get the best guess. Um, so that was, that was an Abacus external solver load case, uh, uh, showing how you briefly, how you could set that up and what you would want uh, and why you would want to use that. So I'm going to save that file. Uh, and I'm going to brief, I'm going to open up another file here. And this is our, ANSYS example. Um, so those are the uh, results. Here, uh, here I have another force versus displacement curve. You can see this is all negative. So this is going to be for a compression test. This example is for a, um, is if you want to take friction into account when you're doing your, uh, your your compression tests. You know, normally when we do these sorts of models, we take the stress and strain and we disregard the friction force that is in between the platens and the specimen. Here at Veris, we do our best to reduce that friction by using things like oil or PTFE grease, uh, depending on the material and what's best for that particular application. And we find that that gives us a fairly um, a good approximation of, of low to no friction uh, up to moderate strains, maybe 50% engineering strain and compression. But if you're going to higher strains, then that friction can really become an issue. And we sometimes do tests up to 70 or 80% strain. Um, and that's when we really need to do these sorts of inverse calibrations where we model that compression. The caveat here is that it's really hard to know the friction coefficient for these materials and, and the platens. 
So that's something that you need to look into uh, on how you're going to uh, understand that value and understand where that creates errors. Some people will actually use sandpaper on their platens, and this will take make the compression uh, completely frictional with no slipping, and then that can be easier to model. So again, we've got force versus displacement. I'm going to open up this load case. You can see here it says general external solver, um, uh, and uh, I've filled out a few things here. Uh, Material.dat is the M is the material model file that M calibration is going to create. And this command to run, I've created a, a, a batch file on Windows that runs ANSYS with the file I need. I tell it I'm using ANSYS, that it outputs the material file the correct way. And at the end, my data comes out in this compression output uh, table data. Uh, so I'm going to quickly open up the uh, DAT file that I use for ANSYS. You can see here it's parameterized. One interesting thing about ANSYS is all our data analysis we actually do using ANSYS command. So that's this section here. These commands here take the force and displacement uh, from a loading platen uh, and save them to a file uh, for, for me. Uh, and so that's what all those commands do. Uh, so uh, the output of this will just be a text file. This is the model that I have built. Um, so this is uh, this is a, a model that's axisymmetric, and we're also using a plane of symmetry uh, down here at the bottom. So this line right here is the loading platen. It's going to come down, compress the sample, uh, and then we measure the force and displacement required with the remote point, which is up here in this little star. Um, uh, that remote point, we measure the force and displacement used there to get the force and displacement in the, um, for the test. So um, if I go to MCAL, I'm going to hit save. I'm going to quickly hit run once. While that runs in the background, I'll show you the results um, from, uh, from um, uh, from ANSYS. So this, uh, these are the displacement results. This is, I think, believe in the first little step. So they're very small displacements. But if I go to the last set, my last set. Oh. oh, there we go. It's overwritten. I need to reload my data file. Well, we're having some issues right now reading that last set. Um, so I won't be able to show you the strain and stress contours, but you can see here. Um, uh, you can see here the blue line is the experimental, sorry, the blue line is the predicted data from ANSYS, and the red line is the experimental data. So for this, we're getting a much better fit than we were for the last one. Uh, we are seeing uh, a little bit of friction effects here at this large displacement, um, uh, which we would expect. We're a little soft here, but we could uh, fix that pretty easily with some optimization. So if we wanted to, we could hit run calibration and go through um, uh, go through that and optimize the model. So I have one last example that I'm going to show you. Oh, let me save this. Uh, and that is an LS Dyna ball impact experiment. So this um, easiest way to show you is with the model itself. Uh, so the model here, the red is the sample. Um, I'm using quarter symmetry. So this is just a small thin cylinder. Uh, this blue, these are shell elements. These are rigid elements. Um, and these model a, uh, a steel ball. So in this experiment, we take the ball, we drop it from a known height. Uh, in this case, I believe it was about 25 inches. Uh, and then the ball comes down, hits the sample here, and rebounds up. We measure the force from this and calculate the, calculate the displacement based on the problem. And then from there, we'll do these simulations to, uh, to model this material. So the way I've set this up is this ball, it's shell elements. I've added extra mass to all these elements so that we have the true mass of the ball. I've given the ball an initial velocity. I have gravity acting on it in the downward direction. Uh, and, that, and that's how this model is set up. So here you can see I have two plots, force versus displacement, showing the experimental data, and force versus time. Because we're starting to run low on time, I'm going to go a little bit faster here. So again, 
I've set up the general external solver. I loaded my experimental file here. This is the file that I wanted to create, material.k. Uh, and again, I've created a Windows batch file that to call lsdyna. Um, so that's just the lsdyna command with my input file, and I tell it the solver is lsdyna explicit. In this case, I have to use uh, something to extract the results. I've created a, a batch file called lsdyna extract.bat. And what that does uh, is it uses Python uh, to, to pull out the data. Um, so this is the Python file that I'm showing. This is the, uh, that I'm using. These, this is where the results file is going to go. These are some keywords that I need to look into. And what this file does is it opens two files that LSDyna creates. There's a file car, called RBD out and RC force. Um, so that, those give me the displacement of that rigid body, that's the RBD out. And RC force gives me the contact force between the two samples. This goes through and it takes the, uh, the displacement and the force, as well as the time from here, the RBD out. And it takes them all and it creates a file, um, a file that just has time, force, and displacement, which is really what I need to use for my calibration. Uh, and that's what this batch file does here. It calls that. And then at the end, it re reads this results file. So I'm just going to quickly hit save. I'm going to hit run once. This should take about a minute to run. While we're doing that, I should have some files that we can look at here of the simulation itself. Um, so we will put on some sort of uh, look at the Mises stress of this during the test. And I'm just going to start the animation. So you can see there it bounce. We get a pretty high stress right there. This one didn't go to a very large compression. Um, the other thing we can do, we can look at the strain right here. I'm not sure. Let's look at the uh, first principle strain rate, see what it is. So one of the reasons we really like this experiment is that you get a really high strain rate here. Um, so, you know, we're showing something in the 2,000 to 4,000 to 5,000 strain per second. And it's really hard to get that in a normal compression test. That's one of the reasons we like this. Uh, let's go back quickly to the von Mises stress, and we'll do that again. So let's look at the results. All right, so these are the results. The red is the um, experimental data, and then the blue is the, uh, is the finite element prediction. Uh, so the prediction is pretty good to begin with. Um, you do notice here, especially in the force versus time, there's a little bit of ugliness here from the finite element simulation right at the maximum displacement. So I should probably go and look at my finite element model to make sure that there's nothing happening there. Maybe I'm losing some contact um, uh, at, the, at the highest strain. So that's something you should really, I should really check out. I don't believe that this, these little humps there are, are truly what's happening do, during the experiment. I believe that that's an error. But you can see overall, we're getting a, a pretty good fit between the experimental data and the prediction. Um, uh, and that's about it. And if we wanted to improve it, we could hit run calibration. Uh, typically, the way we run these uh, is we also use a lot of uniaxial data. Um, we use those, we'll use those for two, two reasons. One, to get close. And then once we get close, we might start the inverse calibrations because they take longer. As you can see down here in the lower right, the runtime for this was pretty fast. It's 35 seconds for that simulation. That's a lot slower than the um, than MCAL normally runs when it's using an internal solver. There, you can get an entire iteration in one second or so. Obviously, you could do multiple things to speed that up by using more CPUs um, uh, or or simplifying your model, your finite element models. Uh, but generally, they're always going to take a little bit longer. So that is all I have right now for. Um, uh, this um, this presentation. Um, so uh, at this point, I'm going to at this point, I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to turn it over to questions. And if you have any questions, please type them, and I'll and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, I do see here that uh, that uh, Conrad has asked a question. Uh, hi, when was the force multiplied by eight? Uh, I assume that probably happened during the abacus uh, portion. 
Um, so for Abacus, in this particular case, what I decided to do, because I was using that Abacus external solver, uh, I took the force out from Abacus exactly as it, um, as it reports it. And then the data that I put into M calibration, I divided by eight. So I said that was the raw force versus displacement from the universal test frame, um, but that's not quite true. It was the it was it was the raw displacement data, but the force had been changed uh, by that factor of eight. Good question. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? All right, I see there's one here. Let's see if I can read it. All right, all right. So, uh, hi. Before starting the inverse calibration, do you first try to get the best guess from classical M calibration one element with stress strain data approximated? Uh, yes, 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 I do. Um, I'd say it's rare. Um, I'd say it's pretty rare, if never, that all we have are inverse calibration data. Um, so, for example, with the tension dog bone example with the necking, we take the we take the force, or excuse me, we take the engineering stress and engineering strain that we calculated from the experiment, uh, and we do MCAL and use those single element, finite element models and, and get very close. Uh, and then we might either get rid of those low case and use only the inverse, or maybe we'd supplement uh, the, the, the single element, finite element, the single element M calibration classic, as you said, uh, load cases with the inverse to capture, in that case, the necking. And we'll have similar things um, in, in the other cases, like the ball drip impact experiment, we do the same thing. We'll use uh, you know, normal uniaxial compression data to get the model close, and then we'll either validate it with that or if we need it for the higher rates, and we use that in conjunction with the model that's already close. Good question. All right, does anyone anyone else have any more questions? Um, we have a couple more minutes left. Uh, so if we don't see any more questions, I'll hang around for a few more minutes in case anyone is uh, typing furiously to get the question in. But always feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email address is here, uh, S-T-E-L-L-E-R, at barris.com. Uh, you can also call at any time. Uh, or or email at any time. Oh, I see. Um, sorry, I see here a message from uh, uh, Anna. Sorry about that. I didn't see it. Uh, it says, "Hi, Sean. Could you comment on the bulk modulus and coefficient of friction in the previous example?" Uh, I assume this was the uh, ANSYS one. Um, so what I did there, I used. Let's see if we can find it quickly in the file. I believe I used a very small coefficient of friction, 0 .00, uh, 0 0.05. Um, yeah, it's this underscore friction. Uh, oh, 0 0.01, so an extremely low coefficient of friction. Uh, uh, and so that's, that's something that you really need to determine what is best uh, for you. And that can be done either with experiments outside, um, or we will sometimes do a parametric study at the beginning to determine what we think the best guess is. You can also get an approximate guess by going um, into the literature to look at coefficient of friction between, say, steel and HDPE or whatever material you're using. Uh, but there is a lot of engineering judgment in there. Uh, and then you have, you have a question on the bulk modulus. Um, I, I'm not sure what the bulk modulus I used for that example was. Um, can you be a little more specific on on, uh, on, on the question on the bulk modulus? Um, yeah, so in this particular case, uh, the bulk modulus is from the factor D, uh, uh, in, in which is this is the ansys bergstrom boyce model. Um, I wouldn't expect this, the bulk modulus to play a large role in this compression uh, case. We, we have a, um, you know, this was not a very thin specimen. So we're not really doing a confined compression test where the bulk modulus um, really begins to dominate. If we had a really thin sample, say the thick, you know, the thickness to diameter ratio is one to five or one to 10, then you really might begin to see an effect from the bulk modulus. 
but this particular example was twice uh, uh, was one to one, so it had a height of two and a diameter of two. So in that case, I wouldn't expect the bulk modulus to play a big role. It's, it's really going to be the Young's modulus um, or, or the shear modulus. Again, obviously those are all related to each other in the small strain regime, um, but I'd expect Young's modulus and not bulk modulus to play the, the big role in that. Hopefully that answered your question. If not, uh, Anna or Anna, please uh, please let me know. Um, all right, so it doesn't look like I have any more questions. I'll stick around for another four uh, minutes or so. And for those that ask questions, uh, if there anything was unclear, you know, shoot me an email. Um, I'll put my email address up on screen again. Um, you can also call Varus if, if you need to. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, have a great day. Always let us know. Oh, I, you know, I forgot to mention, uh, we, are, we are planning for one more. Uh, we, do, we do have the next M calibration webinar planned. That will be on June 19th. We'll have an announcement out soon. This is going to be an interesting webinar for us. We're now offering with M calibration and poly UMOD a set of pre-calibrated material models. So these would be generic material models that you have for um, that we, you know, for example, we have an HDPE model. So if you need to do a quick and dirty simulation, instead of going to say MATLAB or the spec sheet and getting a Poisson's ratio and Young's modulus, we have a fully viscoplastic material model. It won't exactly match, say, the HDPE that you use, but it would give you a good approximation and might, uh, you know, let you know if HDPE is even an option for the application you're using. So that's the next webinar uh, planned on June 19th. So keep a lookout for that. We're going to be uh, formally announcing on the website soon. Uh, and so we'll be going over what we have with the uh, pre-calibrated material models, how you can use it, uh, and, uh, um, and all the features of it. So look for that one. Um, and if you have any more questions, please reach out uh, and uh, let me know. And if you have any ideas for future webinars, also please let us know. Uh, thank you very much.